Good morning. Um, everyone, please be seated and welcome to the National Archives. Um, this is, um, we're waiting for one more person to come sit down. Um, uh, it's my delight to be chairing the FOIA Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, this is my um, first advisory committee chairing as the new director of OGIS. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I uh, very much look forward to working with all of you to help improve FOIA uh, and the process. And um, I understand this is the third committee meeting, so um, hopefully we'll launch right in. Um, before we get started, I very much want to thank uh, Nikki Gramian, the, our deputy director of OGIS, who held everything together for about seven months and chaired the committee um, while there was no director. And her leadership and guidance is invaluable. And thank you very much, Nikki. Um, as you all know, the committee brings together government and non-government FOIA experts with vast and diverse experience to advise on and make recommendations to improve, improve FOIA administration throughout the executive branch. Uh, and the archivist has appointed um, each of you uh, in recognition of your FOIA expertise and with the belief that you'll be able to contribute to important work. So um, I know the committee has an important role to play in improving FOIA, and uh, I'm very excited to serve um, as the new chair. Um, just uh, Tom Sussman actually reminded me during the 2014-2016 term of the committee, the FOIA Advisory Committee produced a final report that went over to OMB. Um, and we have uh, checked in with them recently. They're, um, they, uh, it's still sitting there, unfortunately, but we hope that there'll be some progress made uh, soon. Uh, we very much look forward to continued collaboration between uh, requesters and federal employees serving on this committee, and certainly it is our intent at OGIS to provide as much leadership and uh, support, administrative support as possible to ensure that we actually deliver a meaningful result uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the committee term. Uh, now, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce to you the Archivist of the United States, uh, Mr. David Ferriero. Thank you, Alina, and good morning. Welcome to the third meeting of the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee for the 2016-2018 term. We're bringing, bringing together federal government staff and U.S. citizens to tackle some of the greatest challenges facing this committee. This truly embodies the spirit of open government. At this committee's previous meetings, I shared updates on our search for a new director of OGIS. Today, I'm happy to see Oh, just as recently installed director Alina Simo sitting at the committee table. About three years ago, we wooed her away from the FBI to be the National Archives Director of Litigation. She's a dedicated public servant with extensive FOIA experience at both the administrative stage and in the federal court litigation. She has a vast knowledge of this agency and a commitment to open government qualities I know will help her succeed as the OGIS Director. I also want to thank Nikki, Deputy Director Nikki Greenman, for wearing multiple hats, not just once, but twice, um, while we continue to search for new directors of the OGIS. So thank you, Nikki. Turning to this committee, I announce the appointment of a new committee member, Ms. Sarah Kotler. Sarah, welcome. She's the direct, Sarah is the Director of the Food and Drug Administration's Division of Freedom of Information. Since joining the division, Sarah has overseen a 70% reduction in FDA's FOIA backlog. Come and help me with mine, please. <laughs> Improved processing efficiencies across the agency vastly increased the number of records posted proactively and worked directly with the requester community to improve the FDA's FOIA program. Prior to joining the Division of Freedom of Information, Sarah was an attorney with the FDA's Office of Chief Counsel and an attorney in private practice. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a Juris Doctor degree from Harvard Law School where she was an editor with her Harvard Law Review. We're excited to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your willingness to volunteer also as a new co-chair of the Subcommittee on Accessibility. Today I look forward to hearing about the progress of the subcommittee that the subcommittees have made since our last meeting and listening to the presentations of the guests joining us. But before I turn the program over to Alina, I want to point out that we will host another very exciting open government event in less than two months here in the William G. McGowan Theater. 
I hope you'll mark your calendars for Monday, March 13th from 1 to 4.30 and join us here for Sunshine Week 2017 at the National Archives. Thanks for all of you for coming today and now it's yours, Alina. Thank you, David. Um, as a reminder, information about the committee, including members' biographies, uh, committee documents, public comments, are all available on OGIS's website. Uh, we are live streaming this meeting. Uh, we will make video, transcript, and meeting me materials available on the committee's webpage, so please uh, check it out um, after this meeting. And uh, we expect to have all of our meeting material available uh, within the next 30 days, um, hopefully sooner. And uh, thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. So I want to go through some housekeeping rules uh, before we get started, uh, go over our agenda and set some expectations for today's meeting. Um, as we begin our introductions, again, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us and for stepping right up to be the co-chair of the Proactive Disclosure Subcommittee. I really appreciate that. Um, I also want to note that committee member Logan Perel, um, who uh, was co-chairing or is co-chairing the searches subcommittee. Uh, he was previously a DHS, recently left to go to Treasury Department, and he was unable to attend today because he is waiting for approval to continue to participate, uh, but we hope he'll be able to resume his functions and join us at the next meeting. Um, next, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, introducing the committee members, uh, both by phone and in person. And uh, I'm going to get started with the folks who are on the phone first. If you could please uh, introduce yourselves and remind everyone, please, of your profession and your affiliation. Um, and I was told initially Joe Eggleston was on the phone, but she's here. So I can start. This is, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. And Margaret? Yeah, this is Margaret Quoka. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Denver Stern College of Law. Okay, and Sean, are you with I'm, us? Uh, James Hirschberg. I'm professor of history okay. and international affairs at George Washington University. And Sean, are you on the phone yes. with us? Uh, this is Sean Moulton. I'm the open government program manager uh, at the Project on Government Oversight. Okay, is there anyone else on the phone that we missed? Okay, uh, can we hear from everyone in the room, please? Um, I'm gonna start with the end, the Siberia end, as I like to call it, at the end of the table. Uh, to my left, please. Uh, Chris Knox, I'm a managing director uh, at Deloitte in the Forensics Investigations Division, and I'm not quite sure what I did to get banished to the end of the table, so. <laughs> Ginger McCall, I'm an attorney advisor at the Department of Labor. Sarah Kotler, I'm the FOIA officer at the Food and Drug Administration. James Valvo, Counsel, Senior Policy Advisor, Cause of Action Institute. Lynn Walsh, I'm the President of the Society of Professional Journalists. Hi, I'm Raynell Lazier, I'm FOIA Manager at CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I'm Jill Eggleston, I'm the FOIA Officer at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Tom Sussman, Director of Governmental Affairs for the American Bar Association. Melanie Pastey, the Director of Office of Information Policy at Justice. David Pritzker, Deputy General Counsel at the Administrative Conference of the United States. Michael Bekesher, an attorney at Judicial Watch. Stephanie Carr, the uh, FOIA officer at the Office of Secretary of Defense, Joint Staff. Uh, Nate Jones, Director of the FOIA Project at the National Security Archive. Okay, uh, thanks very much everyone. Um, I just want to remind everyone since we're live streaming and for purposes of minutes of the meeting, it's important to every time you speak, just remind everyone who you are in case we forgot. Um, and there's also gonna be a slight delay, I am told, um, for those members who are on the phone um, and when the microphones in the room are turned back on. So we have to remember as we're dialoguing. Um, I have just a few administrative comments and then we'll get started. Um, again, just, uh, stating the obvious, this is a forum for public discussion of FOIA issues uh, and we offer members of the public who are um, here today to join us and share their ideas. We will have a public comment period at the very end. We also encourage the public to share their written comments with us uh, and any suggestions by submitting them to our website at ogis.archives.gov. 
Um, and to promote openness, transparency, and public engagement, uh, we do post committee updates on our website uh, and on Twitter. So I have to give a Twitter um, shout out. Uh, I am actually very excited to report that we've reached over 1,000 followers, so um, we're making progress. Please continue to join us. Um, all the URLs are on our website. Uh, we will take a 15-minute break uh, halfway through if, um, if we end up uh, moving ahead a little bit earlier in our program. We'll take it a little bit earlier. If anyone needs a comfort break, uh, let me know that as well. You know, pass me a note. Uh, there is food and drink available at the Charters Cafe, which is located on this level. Um, and as a reminder, no food or drink is allowed in the theater. Uh, there are restrooms directly outside the theater and um, another set near the cafe. Okay, uh, so we're gonna get started. The first matter um, of business is to turn to our attention to the approval of the October 25th, 2016 committee meeting minutes. Um, I am advised that the committee members have all had a chance to review them, and um, there have been comments that we have received and we have incorporated all of them, and I have certified the minutes. So um, if I could have a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you. Um, do we have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? All right, the minutes have been approved. Uh, they will be available for public inspection on our website. Okay, uh, we're moving right along. We will hear from each of our three subcommittees today, uh, proactive disclosures, efficiencies and resources, and the searches subcommittees. Um, just a reminder, and this is my pitch, um, it's never too late to sign up for another subcommittee. Um, there are three members who have signed up for two, so if you want to join them, please feel free to do that. Um, we are going to um, uh, be happy to have anyone join any of the three subcommittees, so that was my plug. Uh, we will have two presentations today, um, then we'll open the floor up for discussions, uh, and on our uh, first item on the agenda is an update from the Proactive Disclosures and Accessibility Subcommittee. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn our meeting over to Sarah Kotler and Margaret Quoka, um, who are going to provide us with any updates and uh, introduce our speaker today. Well, Margaret's going to start on the phone, um, Great. To discuss the updates, and then I'll be introducing our speaker. Okay, so Margaret, you're up. Thanks so much. Um, and sorry that I have to join you remotely this time. Um, so I'll just be very brief in our update. Um, for some administrative reasons, it took us a little while to get the ball rolling, but we have had our first proactive disclosure subcommittee uh, meeting and um, our conference call. And we have done, I think, quite a good amount of organizational work to get our work started. Um, we uh, based our um, kind of plan off of an idea that we should continue the work that was being done um, in the proactive disclosure subcommittee in the last um, term of a, this advisory committee because they really managed to advance the ball significantly and um, we want to be able to build on that work. And so there are kind of two um, areas in which um, that iteration of the subcommittee and ours will focus. Um, and one of those is the question of how agencies should identify records for proactive disclosure, how they should identify what records um, they should be targeting for those efforts. Um, and second, the logistics of uh, proactive disclosure and in particular um, any barriers posed by Section 508, which of course we had a, a presentation on in the last uh, committee meeting. And um, to that end, we decided that uh, one thing that we could do that would be beneficial would be um, to kind of do a little bit of investigative work or case studies for agencies where we have reason to believe that there's some really good or creative or um, strong uh, efforts in the area of proactive disclosure to find out how agencies are currently identifying um, targets for these kinds of efforts, what records they identify as important and how they make those priorities, and also how it is they handle technology and 508 compliance. Um, and so we've actually identified five um, agencies that we plan to uh, speak to someone um, in their FOIA office um, and try to have an in-depth conversation about what they're doing and then come back to the subcommittee and maybe um, the idea would be to form a set of best practices and recommendations um, and, and some uh, re affirmative um, steps that we think um, we could take out of, out of that information gathering. 
And so uh, we currently have drafted uh, a, a long list of kind of questions we have for these agencies, kind of template um, interview questions. And we plan to um, get going contacting these agencies and hope to have, you know, at least um, a couple, if not uh, more, of these discussions completed by our next um, committee meeting so that we can report out to you on what we are finding. And um, in, our, in our end goal, we, we hope to come up with um, kind of a more concrete action out of this version of the subcommittee than, um, than last uh, term. Uh, by kind of continue the, continuing the work that they were doing. So um, if Sarah has anything else to add to that summary or anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but that, that's the work that we've done so far. I think Margaret covered it. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Uh, <clears throat> this is Nate Jones from the subcommittee. I would just add that my hope is that at the end of our work here, we have something that when an agency says, we want to post documents online, but we're worried about 508, we can say, here's our best advice, and here's what other agencies are doing to comply with 508. So don't let that scare you away from posting documents. Okay, anyone else uh, on the phone have any comments? On the phone? Um, I just wanted to pass along that um, for one agency that we plan to contact, the State Department, uh, I've already um, circulated a proposal for proactive disclosure of materials that were deleted from published materials in the Foreign Relations of the United States series. And I, I just wanted to let you know that I've already informally circulated this idea to the chairs of the historical advisory committees of both the State Department and the CIA, and they've responded positively and have already uh, said that they will investigate this possibility. Sarah, over to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce, introduce our guest speaker, Phil Ashlaw, who is a technologist based in Washington, D.C., building digital civic infrastructure to support open government civic engagement and economic development. Currently, he is the chief architect at data.gov, where he manages a federated platform for publishing open data and APIs across government. Mr. Ashlock led the development of the Open 311 standard for interacting with government through an open feedback channel and served as a presidential innovation fellow working with the GSA and the White House Office of Digital Strategy on MyUSA. He is also an alum of Open Plans, a New York City-based civic technology organization. Um, uh, I have slides on US. Um, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to give an overview of um, uh, of data.gov and the uh, the policies that, that we work uh, to help agencies implement around open data. Um, and um, the um, <clears throat> so the history of data.gov is uh, we initially launched in 2009, but we've uh, in many ways been the implementation arm of a number <coughs> of subsequent uh, open data and open government policies. Um, the most recent one, <clears throat> the most sort of extensive one, is from 2013, the open, uh, the uh, executive order on open data, uh, which is uh, often referred to as M1313, uh, and implemented uh, through our, our implementation guidance, which is referred to as Project Open Data. Um, and that policy really changed things pretty substantially from, uh, uh, from how things were operating when we first launched in 2009, in the sense that uh, initially, we were just kind of a, uh, a front-facing uh, uh, portal for uh, the public to access, you know, whatever data sets the agencies may have provided. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, so uh, initially, from 2009 to 2013, uh, agencies would, would uh, add their data sets to the .gov. Uh, I think the first policy was really just asking for high priority data sets. Um, but that sort of made us, in some ways, a bottleneck for publishing data and, and for people finding the data in the sense that agencies had to go through the .gov to, um, to, to make it available through and discoverable there. Uh, the, the executive order in 2013 really changed things to much more of a federated decentralized model where agencies took responsibility for uh, not only inventorying all their uh, public data sets, but actually all their data assets, uh, including non-public data sets, uh, through a common metadata schema, which we call the, the Project Open Data Metadata Schema, which is actually based on an international uh, standard uh, from the W3C called DCAT. Um, and so the, that really meant that data.gov was then look, going to each agency's website to pull that metadata, uh, and because it was following a standard, we could do that in a very scalable, systematic way, going to each agency, uh, and agencies could really take responsibility and uh, sort of uh, be more proactive and act on their own schedule to make sure that those uh, data sets were uh, included in that inventory and thus you know, got aggregated and, and syndicated to display and be discoverable, uh, discoverable through data.gov and search engines as well. Um, and uh, um, while you know, that did sort of give them you know, more autonomy, there, was, there has still been this uh, uh, regular uh, quarterly review process, so the policy uh, also goes uh, in line with a cross-agency priority goal on open data. Um, so there have been quarterly assessments. Uh, and we also help manage a, uh, a dashboard that's public, publicly visible to uh, sort of track the status of how agencies are implementing uh, that, the policy and the metadata uh, and the metadata quality uh, associated with that. So uh, also including things like broken links or uh, things that may be out, out, uh, not being updated regularly. Um, and. Uh, We've also been working to help provide uh, feedback mechanisms. So because we act as the, uh, the public-facing uh, view for so, so much of the public to find and discover data sets, uh, they often come to us you know, through our contact page and through some other feedback channels that we have, uh, either looking for a data set or uh, reporting a problem with a data set. And so we've tried to have a more systematic way to uh, handle that as well and to give agencies more uh, access and control of, of participating in that from the very beginning. Um, so we have a, what we just referred to as our data.gov data help desk, um, uh, which as I said before, can be used both to request data sets, but also to report problems with existing data sets. Uh, to report problems, uh, there's actually a button that shows up on every data set page on data.gov, uh, in the top right corner, uh, and then just from our contact page, there's the form to, to request data sets as well. Uh, and that goes into a sort of a CRM system to track those requests, and, uh, and then we, uh, take it upon ourselves to help route those to agencies if it's not uh, sort of obvious enough. You know, it takes a little bit of work sometimes to make sure that it goes to the right person. Um, but we're also working on updating that system so that agencies have direct access to that and can get notifications and in many cases respond to those uh, or have those requests routed to their own systems uh, automatically without necessarily having uh, uh, us sort of act th in, th in that delegation role. Um, but that's something that's still kind of a beta. Um, so I'm probably like halfway through the slide deck right now. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you just want to, uh, next slide. So this is data.gov. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So what I was saying about the bottleneck before or after. Agencies are, it's a more agency-centric publishing approach now uh, where they manage their metadata and data.gov is just a consumer. Uh, in fact, the way that the architecture works currently, uh, there's really, uh, it's actually very e easy for anyone to, oh, thank you. Um, for, uh, for anyone else, including someone from the private sector, to actually do almost exactly the same thing that data.gov is doing, because we're simply pulling uh, public metadata that each agency is publishing and providing a common place to discover that. Um, we also do other things to help agencies along, but as far as the actual public website, there's a lot of ways that, the, uh, that could actually be duplicated out from the private sector. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, the, the implementation guidance for the policy is mostly found on the Project Open Data site, uh, which you can Google with projectopendata.ci.gov. Um, and that includes the metadata schema, which I said before is based on an international uh, standard called uh, DCAT, which also builds on common things like Dublin Core. Um, the whole implementation guidance website is uh, built as an open source project on GitHub. So uh, throughout the years, with updates to the metadata schema and things like that, we've invited public participation and feedback uh, on that guidance. Uh, as I mentioned before, the inventorying process for metadata includes not only public data sets, but also non-public data sets. Uh, and we even, um, I'm not getting to the next slide here, we even uh, actually display those non-public data sets uh, publicly on data.gov 
we just include a disclaimer that we're only listing the metadata to let the public know these data sets exist, um, as opposed to actually making them available for download. Uh, and there are some uh, exemptions to that uh, uh, following FOIA exemptions, uh, where um, you know if there's an argument to be made that even some of the information in the metadata um, falls under a FOIA exemption, then that part of the metadata would, would be redacted and would not be public. Uh, so this is an example of a non-public data set. This is an internal uh, API that we use at GSA um, with a disclaimer at the top that says it's not public and lower, lower at the bottom says it's not available for download or, or access because it's not public. Um, we also syndicate non-federal data sets using the same metadata schema and the same architecture. So city, state, county governments follow the same uh, metadata schema sort of voluntarily um, and then we, we work with them to incorporate them just like a federal agency. Uh, so this is sort of a breakdown of uh, this is actually almost a year old, but uh, I don't think the proportions have changed too much. Um, uh, as I said before, we also have a public dashboard to help track sort of the implementation guidance or the, the implementation of this metadata and this architecture by agencies, uh, which is uh, tied to quarterly milestones. Uh, and this also includes some automated analysis to look for things like broken links and things like that, um, which gets very granular and technical, but there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, of detail there. Uh, and then like I said before, you know, we have feedback mechanisms, so we're reporting a problem with a data set. Uh, you can follow the, the, that orange link on every data set page um, or request a new data set from our contact page. And those requests are actually um, publicly visible uh, as long as they go through a moderation queue on our side. Um, the status of those requests are actually publicly visible. Um, this is just sort of our, our, our workflow. Um, and this actually isn't something we follow as, as completely or strictly as we'd like to quite yet. Um, but the top is sort of how the public uh, user would uh, make a request and sort of see it through resolution. The middle is data.gov's kind of role as intermediary there, and the bottom is agencies. And, um, and we're trying to sort of help agencies have more, uh, more involvement and more control of that from the very beginning. It's something we're still working on. Um, I should also mention uh, a project from HHS uh, called Demand Driven Open Data, which is really looking at sort of creating, a, a, I think, a, a more robust uh, strategy for uh, for sort of the supply side, or sorry, the demand side of, of data requests, um, which is uh, a little bit more robust than what we're facilitating in the sense that it really has uh, folks develop use cases for a new data release or an improvement to a data set, as opposed to just saying, give me this. It's saying, like, give me this because this is all the amazing things that I will do with it, um, which sort of, I think, creates a little bit more engagement with the, the data users. Um, uh, just a little technical detail, we're also working on better sort of recommendations on um, sort of deeper, richer metadata as far as data dictionaries. Um, so uh, this has been a, a request that we've had for a while, but um, there's some other, it's actually the government of British Columbia and Canada that's been doing uh, an example of this where they're, they're including the richer sort of <coughs> data dictionaries as part of that metadata. We don't uh, really have good guidance for that and it's not done very well currently, but that's something we're working on and there's uh, some existing working groups in government uh, looking at this as well and some uh, international standards uh, that have been developed. Uh, and then we also follow a lot of the metadata standards and sort of approaches um, being developed in the private sector, particularly with search engines under schema.org. So schema.org is a consortium of search engines helping to provide standards to improve the sort of discoverability and uh, utility of, of, of information on the web. Um, that includes developing schemas for common types of information so that when pu people publish that information on a website, search engines or anyone else, uh, can consume that and do more sophisticated things like it, like provide uh, richer search results uh, with that structured information. Um, and so they've uh, recently, uh, so it's, there's actually been a, a schema for data sets uh, that's, that's been out for a while that follows the same metadata standard that we use. Um, and just recently, actually yesterday or two days ago, Google, <coughs> uh, Google announced that they are uh, treating that as one of their uh, like half dozen uh, special content types which they basically are incorporating additional functionality, additional functionality instead of the way they, they would you know, potentially provide search results and things like that. Um, so this is something we've been coordinating with Google and, and others following the same schema.org standard, but um, you know, we implement this on data.gov. Google's not yet doing anything uh, interesting uh, necessarily with how that results, uh, how search engine results, but uh, I think we're getting there. Um, and this is their, their, guide, their documentation for that. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a broad overview of, uh, of where we are with data.gov. I don't know if we have time for questions or... Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so my question, I've asked this <coughs> before, but I think you're probably the right guy to answer it. Would it be possible for an agency, if they wanted to, 
to do a data set of all of their FOIA responses for one year. Does that make sense? Um, so a, a single data set that's just the metadata put it on, requests? Put it on data.gov, yeah. Well, yeah, the, so you probably know, but a lot, most of the time, a response is a piece of paper or a PDF document, sometimes an Excel document. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to post all of those for one year on data.gov as a data set? <coughs> Um, I don't see any reason why not. Um, I, I mean, I think different agencies have different sort of approaches to how they do that. I, I should mention the caveat that um, we are a metadata catalog, so we are a place where people can, you know, uh, find find the metadata, which then points to the data sets. We don't actually host the data, um, so agencies would still need to host the data somewhere. Uh, we are looking to help provide better sort of solutions and answers to that uh, as well. But um, yeah, I mean, just from a technical capability or from our standpoint, I don't see any reason why that's that couldn't be something an agency would do. But you, I think, you haven't, I guess I should have asked first, are, are any agencies doing that already that you know of? Um, so I, I know, heard, I, I know I've seen data sets that are just um, sort of a spreadsheet listing requests and, and I think the status of responses, but I don't know that I've seen something that clearly ties the data that's made available as being responses to FOIA requests. That's not to say it's not there, I just, I'm, not, I'm not aware of good examples of that. in 2013 mandated, thank you. Um, if you go to the project uh, open data dashboard, um, <coughs> which crawls um, all of the different uh, government websites that are, are uh, subject to it, I believe that's only CFO Act agencies? I don't know if you, Correct. Yep. Um, it has not been updated uh, the last two periods. Um, currently, if you go online, it ends at uh, in August of last year. Um, is uh, the GSA or OMB uh, not updating the last two instances because of capacity and staffing, um, or is there some other reason that we don't have updates? So I think there should be an update for the last one ending in November. Um, if you go to the website right now, it is not there. Um, uh, okay, I'm, I, I, so it's, uh, I'll have to check on that. I don't think that's the case, but um, I don't think there's, a, there's any, any uh, good explanation I have other than capacity. Um, I know that has been a challenge. Um, but it, I mean, I think it is also, uh, there are some technical hurdles that we also continue to deal with, um, mm -hmm. which are also partly our responsibility that since we help manage the platform. But as far as the quarterly reviews, uh, I mean, that I think the best effort is has, has been to complete those within the first few weeks after the, the quarter ends. And in mm -hmm. my years, I think that timeline has always really been driven by staff availability to, to do those reviews. To that point, do you still have colleagues in the White House Office of Management and Budget who are doing this work? Absolutely. You do? Okay. Um, and lastly, uh, with respect to the completeness and accuracy of the enterprise uh, data inventory sets of the CFO uh, Act agencies, uh, how many of them have posted a what they would describe as a complete inventory of their assets, including um, metadata about non-public data sets um, on this dashboard? Or, or I should say, um, in a place where this dashboard can measure it. So that that is a, <clears throat> I think that is one of the um, the measures that's not something that's super automatable to discover. It depends on mm -hmm. uh, a combination of assessment from the agency and assessment from OMB. And I believe that there are that is a, a field in the review. Um, so that, that is something that we should be able to to list. But I, I have to go through the dashboard and see what that is. But it's uh, I think often it's a difficult question to answer, um, mm -hmm. and it's. There are a couple different um, methodologies for looking to sort of spot check that, uh, mm -hmm. which it potentially could be more robust than they are, uh, looking at you know, things including FOIA responses, SORN, CIA, all, all, yeah. these, all these different other systematic ways for, for looking at things that would help identify what the whole universe is. But um, I think it's still, it still is a, a challenge where there isn't necessarily one rigorous uh, test that all agencies are all, all, all uh, uh, using for their own assessment. Yeah, I mean, full disclosure, Sunlight in 2014 and 15 tried to do an assessment of how complete these things were. It took a lot of effort. I inherited that responsibility last year and I still haven't completed it yeah. uh, I mean, from I, I civil will society that, side. That there are some agencies who I think have developed very good and very robust strategies to do that. I mm -hmm. point out the Department of Transportation, uh, they published their strategy and, and, um, um, and their sort of way of, of looking at sort of other ways to check the completeness, but um, it has been a challenge. Last question. Um, as you know, the U.S. government's developing this uh, release to one, release to all 
uh, FOIA policy. Um, we expect uh, that requests that are um, made uh, that create, that show demand, um, it will result in more publication of those requests. Uh, the default is that we'd imagine they'd be in FOIA reading rooms. Um, has there been any um, preparation for the prospect of agencies publishing um, machine readable data sets that are um, requested through FOIA on data.gov and connecting uh, the requests through a, a redesigned FOIA.gov um, so that people can understand the arc of the records request from the incoming request store um, to where the data set actually ended up on the internet. So there definitely have been conversations about that. I mean, that idea has been brought up a number of times. Um, I don't know that we have any kind of formal arrangement in place to make that happen. It's certainly something I would like to see, but mm -hmm. um, uh, I think so far those kind of conversations have still been a little bit more informal. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Okay, anyone else have any questions? I'm just curious uh, if you can identify the, uh, the greatest obstacles that you've confronted uh, when you see opportunities at agencies and are unable to realize an objective of getting uh, data sets posted. Sure. Um, I mean, I actually think in some ways that two of the biggest obstacles we've seen are um, are surprisingly things that you wouldn't think are that big of a challenge. Um, one is, uh, I think for agencies that actually have a long history of doing a good job of publishing data, this is in many ways the first time that there's been a kind of a mandate to have a consistent comprehensive way of managing that across all their, the whole enterprise. Um, so I think there's, there's been just a challenge for some of the, the really big data publishing agencies to adapt this really rich long history where they have all these different websites and systems uh, to, to align to a common metadata standard and things like that. Um, so it's sort of, in many ways, the challenge of what has already been success, sort of, but now transitioning into a more consistent, comprehensive strategy across the whole government has been a challenge for some agencies. And I would say, you know, to counter that, some of the agencies that are maybe doing this for the first time, starting from scratch in some ways, it's a little bit easier because we're sort of uh, providing some tools and systems that they can start uh, from the beginning in a consistent way. Um, and another, I think, very simple bottleneck is just um, sort of technical or, or uh, hosting challenges as far as, you know, just having hosting resources easily available without necessarily a huge amount of uh, contracting burden or other bureaucratic burden to go through to put a new file uh, online. So in some cases, there are agencies that already have a good place to host files. In other cases, they might have to go through a whole new contracting action or uh, some other long process just to post a simple file online. So we're looking at ways to help provide some solutions to that, but I mean, we've noticed lots of instances where there are agencies who are very interested and excited to put some new new data online, but just uh, the common challenges of, of hosting a website uh, interrupt that. Can I ask you a uh, A related question is, do you uh, determine when you, uh, uh, I guess, review what goes up through data.gov as to whether or not it's uh, uh, 528 compliant, 508 compliant? Um, uh, no, I mean the, the, um, the actual underlying data sets, whether it's a CSV file or a geospatial file, um, you know, we certainly don't review, we don't play a, play a role in reviewing each of those. Um, I mean the, the basic concept that those files are machine readable should sort of almost by definition mean that they have accessibility capabilities behind them. Um, uh, through software that reads those file formats, but um, but that's not something we certainly you, you don't, we don't play an active role in, in reviewing that. From our from our perspective at data.gov at GSA, um, there I mean there are other things that we do as far as you know doing our best to make our own website uh, five way compliant, um, and uh, you know, I think there's probably still ways that we can improve that. Okay, anyone else have any other questions? How about uh, folks on the phone? I want to give you an opportunity to ask. Any questions you might have? Okay, Nate? I have one, just last one. Could you, if we still have time, could you just, if an agency said, we got money, we got power, we want to use data.gov to put all of our FOIA releases from 2010 online, could you just, in a couple sentences, walk through how they would do it? Um, so Indexed on data.gov yeah, and we host them. Right, so if they're already hosting it. So 
the, the arrangement that each agency uses to manage their enterprise data inventory um, uh, varies. Uh, so it all ultimately it all is meant to come out in the same common metadata uh, schema in this data.json file. Um, but the actual management process can vary. Um, and so we don't try and know what that is in each agency. So uh, if someone comes from a particular office and agency, we basically do our best to make sure that they immediately get in touch with the, the main data lead, open data lead for that agency to fit them into the process uh, and make sure that it gets listed in whatever enterprise data inventory system that they're using to, to manage that metadata. Uh, there are a few instances where we actually help provide the systems that agencies are using. So there's about a half dozen, about 10 agencies actually that that are using tools that we provide, so we have a little bit more familiarity of how they, what tools are using, because we're hosting the tools. Um, but that's, that's not, not always. So the FOIA thing. people should be talking to the data people if exactly. they want to do that yeah. at their own agency. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions uh, on for this subcommittee, uh, Sarah or Margaret, any other wrap-up thoughts before we move on? Not for me. Okay, Margaret. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yes, please. I'm just wondering if the slides will be posted online. Yes, I am told okay. there probably will be a slight delay, but yes, they'll be posted. I know. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Okay. Can't control everything. Um, Okay, uh, next we're going to turn, and we're running ahead of schedule, so this is good. We're going to turn our attention now to the Subcommittee on Efficiencies and Resources. Um, as everyone here um, probably already knows, um, resources, or unfortunately the lack thereof, um, is commonly cited as a primary factor in FOIA processing delays. Um, and I know the sub Subcommittee has expressed an interest in identifying and promoting best practices to overcome systemic issues in the administration of FOIA. Um, so this is a very complex topic, um, and we thought it would be very helpful to hear from um, different folks who are dealing with these issues, but I'm going to turn the floor over now to Ginger McCall, who's the co-chair of the subcommittee, and uh, she and Chris Knox, um, her co-chair, are going to provide us any updates um, regarding what the subcommittee has been doing up until now and uh, introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Elena. This is Thanks. Chris Knox, and I'll, I'll provide the update, and Ginger will introduce the, the speaker. Uh, we, we, too, experienced some delays in having our kickoff meeting with the, the election, holidays, and et cetera. Uh, but we have had our first meeting, um, and we've established a goal of providing recommendations for the best and most efficient use of resources. Um, we're going to start by uh, identifying um, what success looks like in the various agencies. Uh, what are the various elements of a successful agency? For example, uh, backlog remediation and, and other elements. Um, how will we know success when we see it? Uh, we're gonna use a combination of qualitative and quantitative data points. Um, what elements also contribute to a lack of success or some challenges in, in various agencies? We plan to utilize multiple data sources to do this. We'll start with the annual reports for quantitative or metric information. We're also going to leverage the uh, privacy officer reports for anecdotal or qualitative information. Uh, of course, we'll leverage the OGIS uh, review reports um, and other data sources. Uh, we'll not only take into account the metric-driven data, but we'll also consider uh, variables such as complexity uh, of requests, uh, number of resources available, the budget, uh, and accessibility of technology. We plan to meet again in the next two weeks, and over that period, the, the various subcommittee members will be reviewing these reports to, to come prepared to discuss, in our own opinions, what, what success looks like and some various identification of what we believe to be the North Star agencies. Um, and and, uh, and that's, that's about it. <laughs> and I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, who is uh, Michael Marquis. Uh, Michael joined the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs in April 2014 as the Departmental Freedom of Information Act Director. He has served for 29 years in the federal government. From 2004 to 2014, he served as the Director of HHS Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, FOIA Office. 
For the past 13 years, he's provided day-to-day -day leadership, management, and oversight within HHS FOIA community. Michael has been instrumental in implementing process improvements ranging from staffing, request workflow, and technology enhancements that have resulted in significant backlog reductions that exceeded the 10% goal for each, sta each staff managed for seven consecutive fiscal years from 2010 to 2016. Prior to joining the HHS FOIA community, Michael was the FOIA officer at the USDA, USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service for eight years. Michael has a Master of Science in Applied Management from the University of Maryland and a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and Health Services Management from Towson State University. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So I just want to let everyone know I came into FOIA from a management perspective. I did not come up from a FOIA analyst perspective. And so uh, it was 20, 20, almost 21 years ago, I was playing Mr. Mom. I was on an extended absence from work, and I got a call uh, from a senior director uh, at the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Uh, notifying me that I was going to be getting a call later that afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, uh, the agency administrator requested that I come into a, a FOIA position uh, to act as the FOIA officer, and uh, it was very interesting. I didn't know, I didn't have a clue about what FOIA was all about. So, uh, so when I got the call that afternoon, why me? That was my first response. Uh, and the response was, well, you're a problem solver. I had been working in human resources and facilities management. I had just come off a huge project uh, with the agency, and so I had built up comp time because I was working crazy hours. And so I was able to take a break. And so um, I said, well, what's the problem? And the one word response was a backlog. So, my FOIA journey began when I came back to work. Uh, so over the past 20 years, I've managed three FOIA units. And, uh, you know, as, as all of you know, backlogs are systematically linked to many issues. It's not as simple as, a, as just the backlog. Uh, hence, managing FOIA operations is tantamount to solving a complicated puzzle. There are days where you or your predecessor, if you've taken over a less effective FOIA operation, force the wrong piece into empty spaces where they, where they sh look like they should fit. As you, continue, as, you continuing, as you continue administering to the FOIA function, it becomes clear that the pieces are, are not meant to be assembled in that fashion. Your backlog and response times are increasing, not decreasing. You and your customers are becoming very unhappy. Now what? Don't panic. Break it up. Pull it apart. Blow it up, as I tell folks. Although the puzzle may be put together the wrong way, you may be on the right track. Change the direction of the pieces. Assemble them in a new way. Envision what the finished puzzle, your FOIA program, is supposed to look like. Now, with strategic intent, begin to identify the critical pieces of your operation that need immediate attention. This is the foundation, or this approach is the foundation for my advocacy efforts. The four factors that have been critical to my accomplishments are accountability, leadership support, strategic intent, and sense of urgency. So let me repeat those. Accountability, leadership support, strategic intent, and sense of urgency. Before you can effectively advocate for your FOIA program, you must examine your workflow processes. Identify opportunities to enhance the efficiencies 
of your FOIA processes. Review your key performance indicators. Next, develop goals to present to senior leadership in order to obtain their support. Share your vision of your finished puzzle, how your FOIA program should function. Work with your staff. When you're working with your staff, I cannot overemphasize the need to create a sense of urgency to continuously imp implement improvements. Finally, celebrate accomplishments. Reinforce those Im improvements. Now that you've taken these in initial steps, begin to advocate for your program. By advocate, I mean the active pursuit of influencing outcomes that directly affect how the FOIA program is administered to the benefit our, of our customers, the public we serve. Our customers, the public we serve, interesting concept. Since we serve them, we should view them as our bosses. Let's not forget them in our advocacy efforts. Advocacy begins with a succinct message that conveys strategic intent. To develop and frame that message for your organization, you must be able to clearly communicate this message with senior leadership, your FOIA staff members, and your customers. Develop a strategic plan to present to senior leadership. Identify key objectives and corresponding short and long-term goals. For example, objective one of the HHS FOIA strategic plan is, quote unquote, making information access easier for FOIA requesters. Objective two is improve the efficiency of HHS processing of FOIA requests. These objectives require active management with a constant focus on key performance metrics, workflow, operations management, uh, management of FOIA uh, personnel. They're all critical how you handle this. Create a workplace culture of accountability throughout the life cycle of FOIA requests, appeals, and litigation. Inform senior, senior leadership of your accomplishments advocate for their support to promote the mission of the FOIA program. Engage them in being part of the solution. Request that they communicate the importance of the FOIA program by establishing performance targets that can be cascaded down and across organizational components. Involve FOIA office staff in creating efficient and effective workflows. So if you're managing a program, it's not, not just your workflow that you want to implement get the staff involved, get feedback from them, see if there are any issues or concerns that they have regarding the, the workflow. Eliminate redundancies in the processes. Utilize tracking systems to track processing times, backlog reduction efforts, et cetera. So uh, to give you an example, when I was the FOIA director at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, I implemented a complete process overhaul. When, and when I say I'm talking across the board improvements, in, which ultimately resulted in uh, across the board improvements in processing times, backlog reductions over many consecutive years, always instill a sense of urgency. Every day I come into the office, there's a sense of urgency to get things done, okay? And communicate that with the staff, let them see that that's critical to success. So as a result of that, uh, and some of you may have heard this before, but I have been known to ask uh, my staff members why some of the oldest cases in their queue, in their, indiv in, in their individual queues uh, are getting so old. I, ba I, say, I, I basically go up to them and ask them, have they fallen in love with those cases? So my guidance to them is break up with them and set them free. Let's get them out. So finally, communicate with your customers. Work with them to succinctly identify their FOIA priorities. Ease the burden and the workflow drag associated with overly burdensome requests. 
pick up the phone, have conference calls, bring in program experts that know what the contents of the records look like. Have a conference call with the requesters. Let's see if we can identify succinct records that are responsive to their requests. So to the requester community, we want to serve you, but we ask that you be part of the solution. Let's talk about how we can provide you access to the records by identifying key search terms, specific time frames. So for many years, and I've been managing for 20 years, my bottom line to all of my staffs has been, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. The same for advocacy. If you're not actively advocating for your FOIA program improvements by involving senior leadership, FOIA personnel, and your customers, your objectives won't be accomplished. Your puzzle will, will remain incomplete. So I thought I'd talk to you briefly about the current, my current advocacy efforts within HHS. Annual reports are great. Chief FOIA officer reports are great. But I've developed a, uh, a new report uh, for HHS processing uh, for, for the entire department that doesn't measure what's currently being measured in the annual report. And I'm, we plan to post this online uh, within the next couple of weeks. This report is a quarterly report of all open pending initial FOIA requests. And the report is tracking both the, or, both the simple track, the complex track, and the expedited track. And I, the public, I believe, deserves to understand what's pending. It's one thing to report on an annual basis what we've accomplished. It's another thing to, re to report what's pending on a quarterly basis so that not only the public can see what's going on, agency leadership understands where the burdens are. And so hopefully that will assist when it comes to addressing resource issues, addressing performance issues, et cetera. This will also, by posting this information, I hope, uh, maintain that sense of urgency throughout the entire department. So I can open it up now if you have any <laughs> questions, concerns. Yes? When you approach your staff to find out about the oldest cases, what did you typically find as the reasons for them sitting around so long? So I, I think it, just because it, they're just voluminous, um, they had the staffs. So usually this happens when I come into a staff, okay? It's not on a continuous basis because I have, with my staffs, I have weekly staff meetings and I provide a lot of data. I, I display the, the terms of the data that, um, for which oldest, uh, the oldest cases, you know, I give them the year that the case was received and I give them numbers. And typically after I approach the staff the first time, you start to see <coughs> cases being closed. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the staff understands that I rely heavily on tracking systems, that I'm actively engaged in overseeing the processes. So. Um, my staffs have been good. Uh, I, I tell them that uh, because what, has, what, my, what I have found over the years is um, that we tend to reward our highest performers with more work. And so I've made it very clear to the entire staff that the expectations are across the board and that they are, everyone is to pick up the pace, that we're not gonna burn out our, our most productive staff by transferring work to them. So uh, accountability is the bottom line. And so uh, that's how I approach the staff on a daily basis. If I'm hearing correctly, it's what I didn't hear, <laughs> that the problem typically is not that it's difficult to respond to the particular requests. So, well, so the question is, uh, if there are difficulties, they should be bringing them to our attention. But the, the issue has been uh, 
that when I come on board on these various staffs, the staffs have never been actively held accountable. And so that's, that's the approach I take. So I've, we've never, all of this, the cases that have existed when I come on board that I press to get closed, eventually get closed. Um, I had, uh, as I said, I, I conduct these weekly staff meetings and I pro provide a lot of data to the staff and um, one piece of the data is I start the, the uh, in my charts, I, it is basically the date that I started on that staff. And I had a staff member come to me one day and said, why is that date on, this, on the uh, graph? And I said, well, because that's the date I started, so I assume responsibility for, for those numbers. And so I need to make sure that we get these, these cases closed and completed while I'm here. So, well, so we give instructions at, at HHS, we have a decentralized FOIA program. Um, I am the uh, FOIA director, the departmental director, but I'm also the director in the office of the secretary. So we transfer the request via tracking system to the program offices or to the, the offices that uh, we, d we believe would have responsive records. And uh, they typically uh, will use a coordinator to put the call out to get responsive records together. Now, it's a whole different thing if it's a, an email issue where we have to go to our IT folks and ask them to conduct the search. So, but uh, uh, that's typically how we do it. So we, my goal is to get a request in, get it logged in and get it sent out for search within 24 hours of receipt. For the three different tracks, what is the average processing time for each and what's, a, what's the goal you have with your current resources and current staff of what those processing times should be? Well, ideally, okay, ideally, it should be 20 days or less, okay? I, I wish I could tell you, <laughs> I, I've got so many statistics going on in here right now that I, I don't have the actual average processing time, but ideally we're trying to drive it down. Um, I am not, I use these, these data points to occasionally intervene uh, with operating divisions within HHS and um, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in the past year working with the Centers for Disease Control because they had a lot of cases that were backed up. and. Uh, I know in, in 2015, our average processing time for simple requests was somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 days. And I uh, uh, spent time with that staff trying to teach them what I call intelligent case management. And of course that, once you start closing cases that are old, those tend to bump up the average processing times. And although CDC had a backlog reduction in FY16 of about 44% due to the sense of urgency and the exertion of uh, effort on my part uh, to that staff and bringing in a new uh, FOIA officer. Uh, that in turn brought up the average processing time um, for the simple track for the entire department. But so that you're going to have this blip on the screen for this one fiscal year fiscal year 17 should be a completely different uh, uh, number. So, it, so from 15, from FY15, it was about 15 days. For FY16, it's probably gonna be up around 25, 26, 27 days. What about for complex? Complex, um, again. Which I, probably cannot be done in 20 days. So what, you know, when you get some of those requests in, what's the goal when? Well, again, we try to push as, as hard as possible to get those things out. And um, when we post this data, I think, you know, you'll see in terms of what's pending. So I'm hoping that using the data that we're about to post, I and mean, that's going to be a good predictor for these operating divisions in terms of what their um, numbers are going to look like in terms of average processing times uh, during the next annual report. So I'm, help, I'm hoping to use that to try to drive those processing times down. 
your, your comment, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done, requires the measurements to have some reliability. And after our last meeting, Melanie and I had an exchange about the, uh, on the number of um, uh, the overall government number of releases is was it 90 percent, 71 percent, 50 percent? Because because partial rate. because partial releases uh, can mean a few words redacted, or it can mean 200 pages redacted. And so the I guess my question is, uh, I think it's still quantitative, but there's also a qualitative sense of. Um, you've got to measure more than the number of cases closed. Uh, have you looked at that? I mean, it, sounds, it seems to me that that's something you probably have thought about. I wonder whether you're, there's some ability to say, you know, yes, it was a partial release, but the only thing redacted was names and social security numbers that they didn't want anyway, as opposed to, yes, it was a partial release, uh, but uh, all we left was the headers uh, on uh, hundreds of pages of documents. So, I mean, I, I, that does... We ha I, I've thought about it. I don't know how to solve that one, um, but that's not to say it can't be solved eventually. I mean, I, I, I can tell you when I was at CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, in order to keep our processes going, um, I was dealing personally with a, uh, a request that it involved a billion pieces of data and within that there were 300 million redactions and I didn't tie up my staff or a staff member to help get that processed. I worked personally with someone in who was an IT expert to get that done uh, and of course you know that counted as one request so I'm, I'm readily aware of that issue so and I wish I had a way of, of solving that um, but the way I've addressed that from an operational perspective is this process that I've called intelligent case management that I set up is I've got the workflow broken up. I've got an intake team, I've got a processing team, and I've got appeals and litigation team. And the mission of the intake team is to keep cases from going to the processing team. So that in terms of improving response times, um, the intake team is responsible for handling what I call the simple requests, okay? no records responses, full releases, um, full denials. Immediately, we get those out of the processing queue. And the processors on the processing team, they focus on the complex cases and getting those out the door. So they've got no um, a basis why they can't be continuously just processing those complex cases and moving them through. Uh, and so over the years, we've seen the average processing time on all the tracks improve, at least in my office. That's, that's my approach to this, so. In, oh, sorry, go ahead. What tools do you use uh, to hold your program offices accountable for providing responsive records? So we, um, we in our office, I, I wish we had better tools, but what we do is we set up um, notifications, automatic notifications, that if they go beyond what we gave them in terms of time frames to respond, they get notified. But I stay in constant contact with my, uh, my uh, intake team to find out who or which programs are not responding. And then I usually make a phone call or two and we try to free up those records. Uh, you know, it's. Fortunately, okay, the, I have been successful in meeting with senior leadership. And, and when I talk senior leadership, um, up to this month, I've met monthly with the deputy secretary to talk about the FOIA program and where we're making achievements, where we're struggling, uh, and uh, was given a tremendous amount of support. In your work, have you encountered any resource issues with staff or technology, et cetera? Um, if so, how has that affected processing and what have you done to address it? So my, my approach to this, having come, coming into the FOIA process from a management perspective, has always been 
you've got to make sure your processes are as efficient as you can possibly make them before you ask for staffing resources. So um, again, it goes back to um, staffs that I've, I've, I, you know, in coming on board into a couple staffs, I've had individuals who have been reassigned to the FOIA office because they were not working out in other areas. And so um, my background was an employee in labor relations, and so I can address performance and misconduct issues, you know, without any problem. And so my, I, what I try to do is uh, uh, I try to get the employees trained if they haven't been trained. Um, I set out the expectations, and we proceed from there. So. Um, but before I will ask for resources, I want to make sure we're functioning as efficiently as possible. Have you needed to ask for resources at any point? And if so, how did you advocate for that? So um, <coughs> when I was at uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, after going through all these uh, steps to improve the processes and backlog reduction, uh, I was the only management official on, over that entire staff, and we were handling upwards of 40,000 requests a year. And um, uh, I put forward a request um, to even further refine our processes, but I would need additional support. And uh, unfortunately, um, I didn't get it. I mean, we were giving them good numbers. Everything was moving in the right direction. Um, but it wasn't until I left that they actually filled behind me and then added three management positions to that. So. Uh, I'm curious, and Alina did not put me up to this. Uh, have you had any experience with uh, OGIS, and uh, is, has it been helpful uh, through either the training or through going for ADR or whatever in terms of uh, uh, assisting you in your objectives of improving efficiencies and the process and resolving individual difficult cases? Yes. So. Um, one of the, uh, uh, I have monthly meetings with our FOIA directors. I have weekly meetings with my staff. Um, fortunately, we don't get a lot of inquiries from OGIS. We're uh, in HHS. So uh, things tend to be moving in the right direction. We do occasionally get some. Uh, it, um, but uh, we've asked, I've had uh, folks uh, go to the OGIS ADR training, especially. Mm -hmm. Uh, my, I heavily emphasize the need to communicate with requesters. Pick up the phone. I mean, I, I have found, especially coming into these offices, when I get there, you know, and I'm looking at the case files, I'm, I mean, I'm getting into the work. I'm like, where's, where are the notes? Do you have an administrative record? Have you contacted the requester? Do they know what you're dealing with? They're probably waiting for a response and wondering what's going on. Um, and typically the answer is no. And, and that's, that's not acceptable in my offices. Um, you've got to make the phone calls. You've got to get connected with the requesters. So, so yes, I do utilize uh, OGIS. Um, uh, I've, I've <coughs> contacted OGIS and uh, have asked for assistance in, in certain areas. And so um, it's always been a very good response. So. In cases for which decision whether or how much to release must be made by someone outside of your staff. How do you avoid having these cases languish somewhere else? So explain to me exactly what you mean, because um, are, we, are you talking about our operating division? So, someone requests a particular record. Right. And for whatever reason, it's determined that someone has to decide how much of that or whether the record should be released. I presume there must be instances in which someone outside of your staff has to make that decision. So when we uh, work with our uh, staffs, we ask for their disclosure concerns. We don't ask that they redact the information. Uh, and uh, I want my staff that I consider to be disclosure analysts to review the records. Uh, they don't, uh, I, I tell them, because occasionally, this, is, this was one of the problems that I've encountered over the years, that 
staffs don't want to provide us records. They don't want to even give us records. So I have to start making some phone calls, setting up meetings with senior leadership. Um, eventually, we will get the records. Um, but I've gained more cooperation over the years as because they've had to turn the records over and we will analyze them and with surgical precision um, redact information. I am, um, I mean, we, I, I could say in HHS, our rate of appeals is extremely low. And that's because we are very precise <coughs> with our redactions when we need to apply them. So in my office, the, redac the redactions are applied by my staff and presented to management for review before a disclosure determination is made. And when I see um, that there are redactions that don't appear to be appropriate, uh, I look at the background information in the, in the file, I talk with uh, the analysts, I talk with program personnel, um, and there are occasions where we, we <coughs> turn the case back and we unredact information so that we can release it because there's <coughs> no basis for withholding. So, but that's, that's done in our office. Um, Lynn Walsh, uh, you mentioned the, that sometimes the employees don't want to call the requester. Did you find out like why that is or what some of those reasons were? I think they're afraid of the confrontation. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be confrontational if we provided better customer service. That's my approach. So. But nothing like coming down from through offices, like, you know, not to communicate or to keep everything via email, just curious. Not that I'm aware of. So not that it, I mean, the success of the FOIA office, okay, and the accomplishments of the FOIA office reside with me. And so um, I make sure that folks stay in touch with the requesters. I mean, we, I, I push, a lot of times I push uh, our intake team to make the initial contact. Um, and occasionally, once we're, once the case is out for search and uh, the components have uh, uh, concerns, at that point, sometimes I actually uh, set up a conference call between the FOIA office, the requester, and the program official because uh, the, re uh, the program official has an expert knowledge of the, of the particular uh, records. The um, requester may or may not know the types of records that are being maintained. And sometimes when we put the two together, uh, they can identify the specific record that they're seeking in it. The issue is we, we speed up the response, so so that's usually at the intake phase. So. You mentioned earlier breaking out the linear workflow puzzle pieces into a more dynamic workflow. I'm, I'm interested, curious, are you doing that manually or you have technologies enabling that? How are you tracking that workflow? Because many of the FOIA technologies that are out there, the case management technologies, really want a linear workflow. When you blow it out, it starts to issues so excellent question so when we were um, obtaining this new tracking system we uh, met with the vendor and told the vendor we would like to specify uh, how you know the uh, the case workflow would work in their system and so we actually coded things uh, based on uh, if it's so it's an intake if it's step one it's we, we designated I1 and then the next step I2 so that as this case is moving electronically, it goes through and then ultimately it goes to processing P1, P2 and once I sign, um, I, I coded it as P4 going back to the, I signed it, it's approved for release, it goes back to the, um, the analyst so that they can package it up electronically and send it out. So at any given so, time, you not only know what's in process or what's in your quote, backlog, but you know where it is in that process. Exactly. We can always run that report, pull and that data will you be, When you report, uh, when you're going to be reporting the data to the website, are you reporting just just in process, or are you going to the granular level of exactly kind of where it is in the process? No, we're not there yet, because so the department being um, decentralized, we are just reporting statistics yeah. in terms of the number of pending cases. Um, I'm using uh, the uh, annual reporting uh, 
format in terms of the number of days that cases are pending, one to 20, all the way up to 400 plus. Interesting. So. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, Ginger McCall, um, if I understood what you just <coughs> said correctly, you actually were part of the process of obtaining that new technology and were able to work with the vendor to customize it to your needs? So they were in the process of obtaining it when I came on board. And so I met with them. I said, look, I don't, my workflow, my FOIA workflow that I, that I like to put in place is different than a lot of other offices. So do we have the opportunity to program the status fields? And their answer was yes. So they worked with us to help create that. And just a quick follow up. Are there other technologies or tools that you've identified that would help to improve the efficiency or effectiveness of your office? That, I'm always looking, I'm always searching for that, so. Sarah. Hi, Sarah Kotler, and full disclosure, Michael's office hears my appeals. Um, so do you use the same process for tracking your appeals and making sure that appeals are being processed in the most efficient way? So we use the technology to track the appeals. That is correct. So recently we've merged, we brought another um, staff into our office that also serves uh, uh, the public health service related uh, organizations within HHS. And uh, so those appeals are being tracked in one system. I've got two parallel tracking systems right now. And so one of the things that we're looking at is whether we can merge the two systems into one, but being that it just came on board on October 1st, I've got two tracking systems to manage that workflow. So they are, yeah, we use it, we use it to track it, but uh, you know, it can be improved. Uh, back before proactive disclosure sort of became a generic independent goal of its own, uh, I recall, I mean, FDA was, the first and maybe the only agency that was not only doing a lot to put things proactively up on the web, but also um, was able to say that the result was cutting down on individual FOIA requests. And I always thought that that was, you know, that we almost don't talk about that anymore. I mean, it's sort of, we talk proactive disclosure as an objective, but not its impact ripple effect down the system. Um, and I always wondered why other agencies didn't sort of say, you know, Eureka, what a great idea. Maybe if we find more things that are commonly requested to put out there, we can actually, in the end, save time and money. So I guess I'm putting that back on your plate. It seems to me that that's something that, with your interest in metrics and efficiencies, that, um, that maybe you can bring, bring us back to have some empirical support for the notion that the government can save money in its FOIA operations by proactively disclosing. And so that's one of the things that we're looking into. When we do proactively disclose on the web, I, I work with our web folks to see if we can get some statistical data to see how many hits were made on that particular, on those, on those records, to help support that. Right. So. And one other observation is probably the oldest person in the room. Uh, you stand in very large shoes. Uh, mm -hmm. Russ Roberts was mm -hmm. probably the greatest uh, FOIA officer uh, that government has seen in, in the early days when the legislation uh, in the 76, uh, 74 amendments came into effect, and he really led the way at HEW and HHS. So uh, I'm delighted to see that tradition sustained. Thank you. I just, it's Melanie Pusta, I just wanted to thank you, Michael, for all, for your whole presentation and just to let folks on the committee know that um, Michael is, is um, a, sort of a star in the FOIA community because of his real focus on metrics-driven FOIA administration and the fact that he comes at it from the management perspective. And so he's been a featured speaker at our best practices workshops on backlog reduction and has shared his all these really good um, ideas uh, pretty widely across the government. So thanks. I want to personally thank you. Thank you, Melanie. I just want to make sure anyone on the phone have any questions before we wrap up. Yeah, this is uh, Sean Moulton with Project and Government Oversight. Uh, one of the things I was curious about was, um, you know, you talked about some of the some of the different metrics you've tracked, and. Uh, one of the things I've heard from 
I believe it's, I think it was DHS uh, some time ago, was that they, as part of their management overhaul, were looking at um, the number of pages that uh, particular FOIA processors were doing uh, a particular day or a week, uh, because some cases, you know, maybe one case and thousands of pages versus, you know, you can have some cases that are just one page uh, for the whole case, and so they're running through case after case, but not, not processing as much. Uh, is that something that you guys have done or considered uh, or, or have experience in? So, Sean, thanks for that question. It's an excellent question. Uh, based on my experience, um, I can relate to uh, that concept in terms of trying to make sure that uh, cases are being equitably assigned in terms of volume. Uh, but also, based on my experience, I can tell you that doesn't work well. Uh, at least in, in practice for me. Um, we truly, um, I, I have seen staff get so tied up with the volume and use that as a justification for not getting cases closed <coughs> that I don't pay attention to that anymore. I, I just push for case closures. Yes, we do have voluminous cases and I set uh, performance goals for the staff in terms of how many cases uh, they should be closing per year uh, but I also take into consideration when I'm evaluating my staff uh, those individuals that have worked uh, those large cases. Um, and it, it, it's not, it does not jeopardize their rating. I, I assess them on the quality of their review and the quality of their um, uh, disclosure analysis. Uh, but I truly focus on um, getting the cases closed. I think that's the most effective uh, way to, to manage the, uh, the office and the workflow. Uh, my, okay, good. Uh, so my other question is, um, uh, I don't know, it, you know, you've come into some, some different FOIA offices and I don't know if you've, you've done this, but I know other agencies when they've had big backlog problems, they've, um, they've brought in temporary staff. Um, you know, I've heard different experiences, either program staff who, who come in um, and uh, help do some processing or even, again, I think it was DHS at one point was using um, maybe even some sort of some interns or fellows or something like that to process the really simple ones and get that down. Uh, and I just didn't know if that was anything you've experienced or you, you know of other agencies and, and whether or not that's, that's a, a, a mechanism that agencies should look towards or if it's a... Uh, if it's a dead end of sorts that, uh, you know, might help uh, show some an artificial decrease, but if you don't manage it properly with the given staff you have, uh, you're going to get behind again. Another excellent question. Yes, I do have experience with that. So back in uh, 2010, uh, when I was the FOIA director for CMS and the mandate came down for the 10% backlog reduction, it came out, I think it was the end of December of 2009, and so budgets were fixed, and uh, I immediately went down to my uh, director's office, and we started talking about how we're going to tackle that. And um, we, we talked about the use of a contractor, but um, I, uh, in discussions, indicated that the, the best thing we could do in terms of if we could, if we could use contract workforce, we would use uh, a workforce, <laughs> contract workforce composed of retired uh, FOIA specialists, disclosure analysts. Um, I would feel a lot more comfortable if that's how it was handled because they, they're number one, they could start, they're familiar with the records, and we could start to get a, a, a production almost immediately. And so that's what we did. I, but I also, I, I also told my director, I said, when you put, uh, when we get a contract workforce together, uh, um, my boss wanted to call them a task force. I said, um, I have no problem with that. I said, but the term task force means that uh, the, it's a limited duration and that it would be better if we actually had resources, permanent resources on staff um, to help facilitate the, the workflow. And um, that my argument didn't go too far. Um, that task force is still in place uh, seven years later. 
uh, but it is helping. Uh, so again, uh, you know, we did employ contract staff. They were former <coughs> disclosure analysts, so they were able to review and close out cases uh, or work to close cases for us. So they didn't, they, the, the oversight was minimal. Course, uh, the quality of the work was there, so. Course, do you do they participate in all the like you were talking about the weekly meetings and they get evaluated uh, the, the same way you're talking about evaluating your program staff so the um, uh, and I, I can't speak to how the contractor would evaluate its employees but we did invite um, the uh, individual who was managing that task force into some staff meetings to to discuss you know performance production any disclosure any concerns that we had regarding that process. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else on the phone? Have any questions? Ginger, question. one final question. I, I don't really uh, require a, a detailed answer, but just to have in uh, our minds, you know, when there are excessive backloads, uh, just to keep open the possibility that part of the problem is overclassification in the first place, you know, as a systemic problem, and obviously it's different from case to case in different agencies. But uh, certainly, you know, sometimes uh, I've received FOIA responses, and uh, it's pretty clear that part of the problem was that material didn't need to be classified in the first place. So it'd be good just to keep an open mind in certain circumstances when finding the reasons for backlog. There are many, including insufficient staff and uh, ex excessive requesting, but sometimes over-secrecy can also be part of the problem. Thank you. Ginger? What do you believe would be the most valuable recommendation that this committee can make to help you and others like you do your job? My number one priority, or, my, or the number one item on my wish list would, for, in terms of Department of Health and Human Services, would be an enterprise-wide tracking system. And so it, within it, your agency? Yeah, yeah, with it, actually within the, the entire department. <laughs> so each, we're, we've got, uh, you know, decentralized operating divisions and, um, Occasionally, requests come in that involve multiple operating divisions. Occasionally, the office, the office of the Secretary, Food and Drug Administration, CDC may be involved in an issue, or NIH bring them in. Um, you know, because there are cross-cutting components. It's like Zika or Ebola, any of those issues. They they deal with more than one operating division, and we all have distinct tracking systems. Um, so, from a a, a management perspective to help even create more efficiencies. I think if we had uh, an enterprise-wide tracking system, we could we could quickly and easily pull data, monitor uh, processing information, uh, and it wouldn't require me communicating with Sarah. Let's say, Sarah, can you tell me, you know, can you give me a listing of, you know, these requests, and we, we could just pull it from the system. You know, she could continue to managing the FDA operations, and I wouldn't have to bother her. Do you so, know of any agencies that have a tracking system like that? I, I don't. So I don't. What's number two and three on your wish list? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, let's let's shoot for one first. Let's, let's try one. So uh, I'd like to work from the top down. <laughs> All right, Michael, thank you so much for your time thank today. You. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Ginger and Chris, any other um, thoughts just, about your subcommittee um, work? Additionally, to thank Michael for his time uh, and to all of the people on the subcommittee to thank them for their time on the phone call yesterday. Okay, any other uh, comments from anyone else on this particular subcommittee? All right. Well, we're actually a little ahead of schedule, um, but I am happy to give everyone a 15-minute break. Uh, feel free to use the restrooms, the cafe, as I mentioned, uh, also on this floor. And uh, we'll come back at uh, 11.50. Thank you.
too bad. You know if there's a phone around here somewhere? Um, you mean like one attached to a board? That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one in that in that control booth, okay. which there should be people on, but you'd have to knock on the door. Okay. If yeah, not, just, you can go to RC. Do you have, did your ID work? Yeah, my badge works here. Oh, yeah. So you could just pop over to B4, which okay. is where we have. Well, they've got it here. I just want to yeah. see if, I want to see if I should stay here or go back to, me, Cheryl's got a meeting at one that I don't know if, which one I need to be at. Uh, ask the boss. It's always a good idea. You'll have to knock on the door. Okay. Okay.
Don't, I don't want to be presumptuous, but this, uh, you work with the lecture. Yes, what I wanted to come introduce myself. I saw you were busy. I was like, oh, wait, did she have someone? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Where do you do that from? Um, just the budget. So oh, I'm God. nowhere. This is like a whole new world. Yeah, so that was the idea. It's in a leadership program. So they were working. So my idea was um, to kind of introduce the idea. Like it or don't like it. A uh, new uh, transcript of an interview with Panetta that happened like two days later, where he said this was a covert action under whatever the statute is. It was mine. I can do it. And they came back and said, "Well, a covert action. He didn't mean a covert operation." So I think the Shepard Declaration is kind of important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's actually that's 
Okay, I want to call everyone uh, back to our meeting. If everyone can please um, finish up your conversations and join us again. That would be great. And we still have folks on the phone. Are you still with us? Yep, yeah, still there. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> So we're back. Hopefully everyone had a good break. Um, we are now going to turn over to our subcommittee on searches. Um, we are, um, did not have a speaker uh, today, so Nate Jones, uh, the co-chair of the searches subcommittee will be our speaker. And unfortunately, as I said, Logan is um, TBD for the time being. So sure. uh, take it over. Sure. Um, so I'll make some comments and then I'll allow the subcommittee and everyone else to um, expand on things or say things I missed or um, disagree with me. Um, but we had our first meeting uh, and um, I think I'd like to make out, start up by making out a larger point. I think one of the accolades uh, that Michael, our excellent last speaker that was a bit buried, uh, was his success in actually following <coughs> President Obama's instruction to reduce FOIA backlogs 10% every year. Mm -hmm. And he successfully did that for seven years in a row, eight years in a row. And um, I guess I'd just like to say, what if every agency had done that? What a better position we had been in had they listened to the president's mandate, as Michael said. So with that segue, why didn't agencies listen to the president's mandate and reduce their backlog 10% every year? I think after our first meeting in the subcommittee on searches, I came away thinking that inefficient search techniques is one very big reason for that. Um, so I'll 
just briefly say some of the conclusions and problems and uh, possible solutions that we talked about, and then I'll talk about what we as a subcommittee and ultimate committee are tentatively, pretty roughly tentatively, planning to do um, with our time here to work to improve searches uh, so that they're not such a problem in FOIA delays. Um, so I think the consensus is that uh, inefficient searches are a huge problem, a huge bottleneck. Me personally, I would probably would say the number one bottleneck. Um, and it's demoralizing. If you have a good FOIA shop and good FOIA officers that are trying to do the good work and love openness and other people in the agency that you tell them to do searches are not doing it, and I understand some agencies are fighting wars, every agency has important missions, there's competing priorities, um, but uh, the point is that there must be ways to improve um, and uh, it's a huge problem from a FOIA perspective. Um, so, some of the solutions or ultimate things that we talked about um, that we're going to strive towards. One is, uh, first of all, finding out what's happening. Um, for a requester, when someone does a search, um, it goes into a black hole. We don't have the data that Michael was talking about. We don't have the data that, oh, it's being searched for in four different components usually, or we don't have the data that is stuck on this person's desk for months, a year, years. Uh, even if there was a way, FOIA Online has a pretty good tracking system. FOIA Online has a tracking system, but it says out for search. If there was a way to allow the public to see where exactly, or I'm a, I would ask for the name of the person that's taking years for the search, that would be big step forward, transparency in how searches are conducted. Related to that, another aspirational goal we talked about is evaluation of the program officer's performance. OGIS, uh, I think still says, I know used to say, FOIA is everyone's responsibility. It was the attorney general, so. Uh, and OGIS <laughs> Just, as well, and the AG, yeah. thank you. Uh, so the Department of Justice Attorney General, pretty high up, and yeah. OGIS, also pretty high up, <laughs> says FOIA yeah. is everyone's responsibility. Um, and that means that it's everyone's responsibility to conduct FOIA searches. From the opinion of our subcommittee and myself, and we can open it up after, that's not happening. Um, we need to reinstill that. One possible way uh, is if there is a way to include FOIA performance for people outside of the FOIA officer's uh, uh, job evaluations or performance evaluations. I know we brought this up before. I know there's big pushback, uh, but speaking as a FOIA advocate, that's the best way forward. FOIA won't really work if people ignore the FOIA officers telling them, do a search for this. Other ways around it, as we heard from Michael, is buy-in from uh, senior agency officials and get them to tell them to do the search. Uh, so. Um, thoughts that we've had. Um, one more larger, larger uh, aspirational idea and then I'll go on to next steps and we can discuss. Um, the issue of e-discovery, a powerful, powerful, powerful tool um, that law firms use it for their lawsuits and uh, government for FOIA requests, I, in my opinion, is largely lagging behind, though it's not unheard of. Um, there are two issues that I'll bring up. Um, James can elaborate. But one is that often we know that agencies have these e-discovery tools because they use them for other things, uh, but they often don't or can't or won't use them for FOIA. One issue is money. Um, I know that uh, e-discovery, people aren't doing it out of the kindness of their heart. They're doing it for money and doing it for maybe per term or per volume search. Um, okay. But on the other hand, that leads the troubling issue that the U.S. government has the tools to uh, do much better searches than they're actually doing. Um, and so for searching for another office, something outside of FOIA, they can do a bang up, awesome, fast, very comprehensive job. But for FOIA, uh, we're often asking people to search their own documents and often they don't even return the calls from the FOIA offices, officers. So that's an issue. Um, one next step we're gonna do, hopefully, is bring someone in next meeting that has had success using e-discovery for FOIA to talk about, one, the power, maybe the uh, drawbacks, 
to and how to uh, be able to use e-discovery, not just for other issues, but for doing FOIA searches. And um, the last issue that I, I forgot to mention, um, the broader picture is uh, expanding another possible aspirational solution is expanding the ability of FOIA offices to search electronic records. I know some offices ha already have this, others don't, um, but uh, the key example is searching emails. Right now I know that some FOIA offices have to go to the IT person and ask them to search emails. Others have to go computer by computer by computer. Uh, no longer after December 2016 are we any longer, I hope, if we're following the law, printing and filing and searching boxes, but until last month, some people did. Um, but the possible solution is, a, is finding ways and find, so that all FOIA offices have access to search email on their own. Um, it also leads to the question of impropriety. If someone does a FOIA request for a government official and the FOIA officer says, search your emails for these words, and the person themselves searches and replies the documents to themselves, it leaves open the chance that they are not uh, providing the FOIA office with all the relevant emails. Um, I don't have to elaborate. Um, so, our next steps. Uh, for the next meeting, uh, we hope to work to get to uh, look into e-discovery and see how we can uh, expand the use of that. Um, learning the strengths and weaknesses. Um, between that, uh, doing something that we uh, had done in the last committee, the National Security Archive, my work, independently is going to do uh, an electronic, um, I guess I'll say the word survey, essentially asking FOIA officials and members of the public, tell us all you know about searches in whatever agency. So maybe someone did litigation and for litigation, they had to explain, the agency had to explain, here's how we did the search. If, hopefully people will respond, tell us that. Hopefully FOIA officers will say, I work at agency X and here's how we do the search. Agency Y, Agency Z. And then the hope is uh, by the next meeting to compile those answers and publish a, a lay of the land because right now, maybe I'm, in, maybe I'm missing something, there's not really a public description of the different varieties and efficiencies and inefficiencies of, of how uh, FOIA searches work throughout the government. So that's our next step. And then our final, uh, or a goal that we have beyond that, after compiling the data, reviewing, um, coming to conclusions together as a subcommittee that we all agree on, um, is to issue a set of best practices that if you want to have a gold star agency, uh, this is how you should be doing your searches. And if you're not, you should be striving uh, more towards doing this. Um, so that's all I have. Um, I'm sure that uh, maybe we can open up for members of the subcommittee and then the public, or then the full committee and then the public. Sure. Thanks, Alina. Sounds great. This Thank is, you. Yeah. Joe? You want to I think Nate did a great job, so I don't have anything else to add. Thank <laughs> you. The only point that I would add about the uh, e-discovery is that it's not that it's unavailable to FOIA requesters, it's that it becomes available to you once you're in litigation. And so the incentives we have now are for the agency to not conduct the search and for me as a requester to get in court as fast as I can so that I can access that tool. Yeah. I, I just, Mel Melanie Paste, I just wanted to um, reinf probably reinforce and echo oops, uh, 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 in particular, Nate, the point you made about I think that the best sort of path forward in terms of efficiency on the issue of search is to have the, mo the most possible control in the FOIA officer's hand. Because obviously, like you said, agencies have their missions, which of course we, we all benefit from and we want them to do their missions, but the FOIA officers, our mission is FOIA. So we are motivated to do the searches because it's our mission. <coughs> so to the extent it can be in our control, the greater proportion of it that can be in our control as FOIA officers, the better for FOIA altogether. I have a question just about that from the FOIA requester side. Yeah. I mean, is it possible and are FOIA offices authorized to be able to have access to the entire agency's electronic files? I mean, because you're talking about email, but you could also be talking about drives that have documents yeah, on them and, right. you know, what's the ability for the FOIA offices um, to have 
full access to an entire agency's electronic files. I mean, it is, it is different the way every agency is set up differently, as Nate said, and the, um, and obviously there are all kinds, there's privacy concerns, mm -hmm. there's national security concerns, there's law enforcement concerns, so there's lots of different issues. Um, as, as we keep finding with all these things, there's nothing is like sort of like, oh, here's a simple thing we could just do. Um, but we definitely have agencies that have greater ability to search records themselves. Um, so, so I think it sounds to me like it's a very valuable thing to sort of try to sort of chart out kind of some of the, the ways agencies are able to do that. Um, and certainly with the e-discovery e -discovery tools, I mean, we've been talking about that now for years because once the FOIA professionals see them, it's just, it's fantastic what they can do. So, um, and it does make your search just so much more efficient. Um, and it's just unfortunate that those tools, the t using the tool, using the discovery tools takes time, which costs money. And that's why some agencies just don't have as much bandwidth for it. Uh, Tom Sussman, Nate, you, uh, you started by talk, sort of talking about tracking ser the search. That's one of the important elements. Uh, and I, I just want to sort of add an element to that, that uh, it, it, it needn't be mechanical and sort of done in a black hole. That is the concept of, okay, here's a request, here it, it goes to someone, and the search begins. And the requester sitting there, you know, not knowing quite what's going on. At best, by maybe we'll see a little dial going, you know, moving forward in terms of days spent, but you're not going to be able to track where they look. And, that's where communications yeah. back to the requester comes in, oh. Melanie Dodds, because this, I make this point at her best practices yeah. every time. Yeah. That I mean, I, have, I had an experience a number of years ago with the FBI. I knew the document. I had seen the doc. I knew the memorandum. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, I made a request, a FOIA request, and they couldn't find it. And it took a long time. But I was getting a call back every few weeks saying, we, we think we now have a new place, and we're going to, you know, I'll, I'll let you know what happens. And, I mean, what a comfort to know that they were still looking and trying new ways of looking, new search terms, new, you know, mm -hmm. that could be in storage, it could be art, things like that. So I think that's a, a, as a best practice as part it's of the search better. process to keep the requester informed. I think you cut down on some litigation that way. I think to the obviously the oh Melanie again, but the the advantage, and of course we've we've talked about this kind of thing before. To the extent agencies can work with the requester to to sort of prioritize where the search will be conducted, what kind of search terms that can help too, and that maybe a requester when a requester is told uh, these to search these officials' files, we're going to, we have to do all these different steps. Their accession, their records are out in Suitland. Do you really want us to do that, or should we focus on the current employees, things like that? The dialogue then helps frame the search, which right. makes it more efficient. They, two, they really work hand in yes. hand. Could you clarify a bit how you're going to conduct this survey? I thought you said that it's going to be done by, by your organization. Is, is, it to, is it going to be represented as an activity of this committee or a subcommittee? Where, where I'm really going with this sure. is that in one direction, uh, you would need to get some internal approvals. In the other direction, how are you going to get the agencies to respond uh, without a FOIA request? Sure. Uh, let me choose my words carefully, but that being said, we did this same exact thing last well, time. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. going to be National Security Archive independent of the subcommittee, so it's going to be the other direction of hopefully agencies um, will respond. and. <laughs> The, re the way I'm, we're going to do it, the National Security Archive is going to do it, is hopefully by the goodwill that we've built up and agencies and employees of agencies desire to help improve FOIA uh, and uh, using media and word of mouth to tell people to respond. And it's going to be National Security Archive only. We'll publish the data on the website and then anyone that wants to can use that data to do anything they want. Ginger McCall, I wanted to say something related to what Melanie said and also to highlight a point that 
uh, Michael Marquis made in the last segment, uh, one of the things that he said that was striking to me was that he essentially got buy-in on the technological system that the agency was acquiring with the vendor as the system was being acquired and, de and designed. Um, I think one of the things that's happening here is that agencies are uh, designing and acquiring systems like cloud email systems, and there's not necessarily buy-in from, from the FOIA officer. Um, so it would be helpful to have that person at the table as agencies are acquiring these systems. Sounds like a good best practice. This is Raynella's here. So I just want to um, speak to the issue of it, what um, Melanie talked about where she said probably it would be a great idea if um, the FOIA officers had more access to the records um, throughout the Bureau. And I think that um, while on its face that, that's a really great idea, I just wanted to throw the caveat out there that sometimes they're very, very complex requests and we consult with our subject matter experts quite frequently. Mm. And um, while it may seem like uh, we know what we're looking for. <laughs> We'd yeah. be able to interpret a request yeah. and be able to, to satisfy that request um, without having to bother the programs or take them away from their, their primary mission. Um, I found that it's extremely helpful to rely on our programs um, to narrow the scope of requests, to focus us um, where we would have um, conducted a very inefficient search. They can say, no, 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 no. That's not what they want at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they explain requests in ways that we had, um, right. you know, better than we could have ever interpreted it because right. they deal with these records on a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah. I think yeah. for emails, um, maybe that's something where you can do a quick keyword search. But I think, um, and a lot, of, a lot of times I find that it's very helpful that the programs are responsible for their records. That's yeah, all I meant no, to say. Yeah, it's Melanie. I mean, yeah, oh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And it's, it's really true, like the, the program, so really you have to have both halves of it mm -hmm. because the program or your experts in your agencies might be able to say, oh, well, when they're using this term in That's their request, I mean. they're meaning mm -hmm. sort of this kind of record. Mm -hmm. And the FOIA person might be, oh, I, had, I didn't realize that that was some special thing that meant, mm -hmm. meant something. Okay, now I know to search here. Um, it's, so you definitely need both, absolutely. And so the ideal, ideally then, either the program office is able to just say, here, if they, if they were able to just say, here's the records, then it's no problem. But otherwise, if they could say, FOIA office, now we've told you where to search, but you can do the search. While I go on to do my program work, then that would be a good outcome. Any other thoughts from the committee members? And let me also invite committee members on the phone if anyone wants to chime in. Okay, I think that was direct silence. Uh, Nate, anything else you want to talk about? No, I um, look forward to working with the subcommittee and the com committee to make uh, tangible progress to improve FOIA searches. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Does any other committee member have anything to add to our discussion today about any of the three subcommittees' work? Uh, Tom? Uh, yeah, I. Uh has had a thought that I just wanted to share and perhaps get some f feedback on. Uh, having looked at the f committee's activities from the previous session, the previous two years, uh, there was a lot of work, a lot of energy, a lot of effort over a two-year period, reports issued that were sort of large and covered you know, a lot of areas. And out of all of that, only one recommendation in a rather black and narrow fee issue you know, emerged as a recommendation of the committee and went forward. Um, and it seemed to me that we might consider, since we're dealing again with really important issues, but they're very big and complicated, we might consider uh, whether some recommendations could be carved out uh, subject to many MINI reports uh, and put before the, uh, the committee and voted on as, as we go along the way uh, so that, um, you know, we don't have to wind up at the end worrying about something giant and big and where, where does it all fit or do we have many pieces to one report or how does all that work. But we can go ahead and, you know, get it out there and then perhaps at the end of the process say, you know, what happened to, to, the, to the three recommendations we made last year uh, and begin to 
do our own implementation without assuming that there will be a renewal of the committee in a year and a half or that any of us would still be around participating. Any comments or thoughts on that? Okay. Um, I, I think OGIS, again, stands very prepared to help you move things along administratively and um, try to make sure that there's a product at the end. I think that's a great interest to us. So um, whatever we can do to help facilitate that, please let us know. So thanks, Tom, for that comment. Uh, I think at this point, unless anyone else has any other comments, um, I am ready to turn over to uh, the public comment section of our meeting. And uh, we're running early, so that's great. Everyone can get a break for lunch a little bit earlier than anticipated. Yeah. All right. So I want to invite um, anyone in the audience uh, to come up to the mics and, uh, and pose any thoughts or comments or questions. And if you could please uh, identify yourself again for the record and um, your affiliation. Uh, my name is Alexander Howard. I am the deputy director of the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, forgive me for arriving uh, at the meeting uh, tardily um, if I missed any announcement or details about this. Um, what is the status of the release to one, release to all Freedom of Information Act policy um, that uh, the last president of the United States directed to be available to the public at the beginning of this year? Um, and when can we expect to have more information about the uh, online FOIA request portal that Congress instructed the White House Office of Management and Budget to create? So on the release to all, release to one, release to all policy, we had, as well, people know, we had two chief FOIA officer council meetings on it. We've done a lot of prep work and getting in, input from both requesters and agencies. We then put the pol a draft policy out for public comment, and the pu comment period ended right before Christmas, December 23rd. We got 30 comments, which are all available on regs.gov, including one from Alex, a really good, very good comment from Alex. We have got really incredibly thoughtful comments and actually going in all directions. Um, and so in some ways, so, I guess it would have been far easier if all the comments were all overwhelmingly going in one direction. And so I encourage those of you who are interested in this topic to take a look at the comments because um, there are really good arguments, especially on the issue of delay, which was the particular issue that we asked for comments. But we had comments in both directions on sort of other aspects of the policy as well. But we got a lot of very thoughtful comments, um, both for and against the idea of a required delay. So. At this point, we're just absorbing all of that, thinking about all that um, within DOJ to decide on the best, best path forward. Um, obviously, what will, you know, when we have our, our decision on how we want to go, we'll, it would be a, you know, we'll issue it as, as a policy guidance. Um, but right now, we're really literally just trying to think and consider thoughtfully all the comments that we got. On the portal, the really, really good news for, for that is that we got money for the portal, which was a huge, it was one thing to be told to build a portal, it was another thing to have money to build it. So we have an uh, allocation of money. And so the, um, this past month, we've been doing all sorts of internal paperwork with budget and things like that, um, and we're hoping really literally within the next couple weeks that we would be starting our launch of the first phase of the project, which will be, we will be working with 18F. And they do their, they're gonna do their kind of traditional, what they call their discovery period, which is gonna be three months of working with both requesters and agencies who are future customers of the portal to get, you know, the whole way um, 18F works is that agile development and very user focused. So you'll be seeing things on our website soon, alerting people to it's starting, we need, we want people to come and look and see what they're doing, we want people to give feedback to 18F. 
Uh, they'll do that discovery period for three months, come up with a plan for how we go forward, and then after that we go forward. Our money um, is for this fiscal year, so we're really move. We are very obviously highly motivated to get this thing done as far along as our money will take us this fiscal year. So two questions. Um, one, and forgive my ignorance, uh, reading the fact sheet from uh, the last administration, it appeared that the president directed uh, that this policy be available on the first. Was that not a clear guidance? Is there a reason that the agency is not complying with the direction of the president? So, I mean, I think it would be probably, I'm not really the person to, to answer that question and the Clearly, the way the policy, the timing of the policy, I think everyone can understand the timing of it is very, was, was very difficult with it. If not you, whom should I direct this question to since it is the Department of Justice that is in charge mm -hmm. of this policy? We're in charge of the policy and I just mm -hmm. gave you the answer about what we're doing. What's which is that we're, we're considering the comments, the really thoughtful, good comments that we got from the public comment period. When should the public expect okay. the policy to be on the internet for us all to see? So, I, I'll, as I said, when we're ready with the policy, obviously we'll make it available publicly. Okay. Okay. The Sunlight all Foundation right. understands the President to have directed the Department of Justice to publish this by January 1st. <laughs> You're now telling me three weeks in that you're still deliberating. I'll put a chit down here on the record. If we don't see this online by the end of the month, we're going to file a FOIA request for it. To the second question, you, you our don't understanding. You file a FOIA request for the policy because we put it out for public comment in the You put a draft register. of the policy out. You have not put the policy out as the president directed. You can see the draft policy on, on regs.gov. It's totally available. Alex, we don't. I don't, I'm not going to keep answering questions um, that are just sort of designed to be adversarial. So I it think is I'm our done. job to be adversarial. Well, that, that, is, that is literally what I've been told by my board and encouraged by the public to do. You, right, never the mind. second thing is that I understand that Congress directed the White House Office of Management and Budget to build the FOIA portal. Mm -hmm. How much money has been allotted to it and are they actually heading up development or not? So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm stopping my response to this line of questioning. So. Should we request formally how much money has been budgeted for the FOIA portal from the Department of Justice then? I just, it's just like this. I, I'm just not going to. It's just I, it's so unnecessary to be adversarial. So I'm not going to participate in it. Okay. And I'm, I, I'm very disappointed, Alex, that this is how you're asking questions. Your spokespeople do not respond to our inquiries. Therefore, it is up to me then to go to public forums to ask these questions in public. I would prefer to get answers to our inquiries directly through the communication staff of the Department of Justice. If you respond to us, then we are able to get answers that way and to share them with the public. That is how I would prefer to conduct public business. I don't think asking how much money has been budgeted is inappropriate in a public forum. I don't think asking which agency is in charge of doing it is inappropriate in a public forum. And I don't think asking for a deadline for when the policy will be available is inappropriate either. And I'm sorry that you take it in that form. Thank the you for answering the question. The questions themselves are not inappropriate. It's the way you ask the questions. I gave the briefing on what where those projects are. Okay. Um, We're working I'm, on the portal. We look forward to updates from the department on that context. We also look forward to updates from the White House, given that they were the ones that Congress directed to build it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other comments or questions for the committee at this time? Anyone else want to uh, have any other follow-up statements or thoughts about our next meeting? Anyone on the phone? Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for all their hard work today. I think we asked a lot of great questions and spurred a lot of great dialogue. Um, again, we're going to invite everyone to visit our website and social media for more information about this meeting and um, uh, invite everyone to come to our next meeting, which is scheduled for Thursday, April 20th, 2017, after tax day. So everyone should be able to come. 
Uh, we're going to begin again at 10 a.m. in the same uh, location, and hopefully all of our uh, AV difficulties will be resolved by then. And uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you.